Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming. I'm Katie, and I'm a distance education librarian at Johns Hopkins University. Uh, and today I'll be presenting 10 tips for creating engaging library webinars. Um, we don't have a lot of time, so I'm just going to dive right in. Uh, and just to give you sort of a little bit of context, um, using these strategies or a combination of them, we were able to increase attendance at our library library webinars by nearly three times in just one year. Um, so uh, I work on a team in the Hopkins libraries that provides online library services. So we're dealing with uh, specifically a fully online academic library uh, with a primarily adult and non-traditional student population. So many of uh, our attendees are students working part-time because they work full-time or going to school part-time, excuse me. Um, and so just like I said, diving right in, uh, the first tip that seemed to work for us is just being relevant. And so um, what seemed to work for us specifically is looking at our reference stats. So in other words, what do you get the most questions about? Um, and you might feel like you need uh, students to know about certain things. For example, maybe you feel like they need to have just a general overview of the library. But it may not be a direct need from their perspective. So uh, topics like uh, APA citations, um, how to use Google or Google Scholar, um, or even how to do genealogy research if you're in the public realm um, might be some more appropriate topics. Um, you also want to try to avoid library jargon and try to use terms that your users use. Um, for example, uh, in one of our webinars, we decided to use the term credible resources, uh, how to find credible resources instead of, say, how to find peer-reviewed articles. Um, and that was because that was the terminology we were seeing faculty use in their assignments. So that just kind of resonated more with the students. And we got a pretty high turnout for that one. Um, or, you know, you might want to say something like save time on your assignments instead of how to use the library's research guides or libguides. Um, so just being conscious of, you know, what, what kind of rings a bell for students. Um, the second tip that we have is time your webinar at the point of need. So, um, you know, if you're in the academic environment, if you've ever planned a library instruction session, you've probably tried to time it so that it's right before a big assignment um, or when students are doing research. So the same goes for webinars. Uh, and for us, this means waiting a few weeks into the term when students are starting their research process um, instead of having our webinar the first day or first week of classes. Um, so that's really helped uh, get our attendance numbers up, I think, as well. Um, and just from looking at the literature out there and some of the studies that have been done um, about webinars and scheduling, the most popular times are midweek and midday. So these would be on a Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And uh, peak times tend to be 11 a.m. or 2 p.m. Um, so uh, for our population, we've been doing 2 p.m. and it's worked out really well. Third is just knowing your audience. Uh, this is probably common sense, but um, with us, our primary art audience uh, is adults, some of which are older. So we've learned to anticipate uh, some technology issues, including audio issues. Um, we've had to deal with background noise sometimes um, for using a software that doesn't automatically mute participants. Um, so we've heard kids yelling or the sound of TVs in the background. Um, we're also aware that a lot of our students are on tight schedules and they want to get exactly what they came for. So we try to be very prompt and start on time. Uh, fourth, this might be the most important piece, um, is marketing your webinar. So. Um, Based on the research I've been looking at, which I admit is somewhat minimal at this point, um, the best practice seems to start about two weeks in advance. Um, that's when you want to use all the channels that you have available to you to get your announcements out. So this includes email invitations, blog and social media posts, homepage banners and libguides boxes. Um, and if you're in the academic environment, faculty and course announcements, faculty can be very powerful uh, marketing tools. Um, and if you're in a physical library, things like flyers and table tents, and of course, word of mouth. If possible, you also want to uh, have registration available and send reminders. Um, we've actually tried both ways with different types of software, having registration and no registration. Um, registration definitely seems to work better. Um, 
and it was also recommended to us by uh, our college's marketing department. Um, and sending email reminders, um, I think we send uh, like one the week before and one the day before, and that seemed to work well. Next is collaborating with others. So like I said, we've worked with our marketing department a lot to promote our webinars, um, especially recently. And this has really, um, I think, boosted our numbers. Um, they let us use their mass email uh, tool to send the original invitations. Um, they were also willing to share our webinar announcement on the, uh, the main social media channels. So, um, for example, they shared our announcement on the main college Facebook page, which um, has a reach of uh, over 19,000 as opposed to what we were doing, which is just sharing it on the library page. Um, and that reach was only about 300 people. So it was a big, a big jump in numbers there. Um, they can also help you craft your messages, um, especially if you work in the academic setting. The marketing department knows your audience too, um, so they can be very useful. Uh, also, uh, you might have an IT or a tech support team that will be willing to help you with um, troubleshooting or technology issues. Um, and finally, you can also, uh, what, what we always do is um, we partner up. So asking one of your colleagues or coworkers to work with you to monitor the chat and um, help answer any questions that you can't get to. Uh, I know during our last webinar, we had so many questions um, at the end, uh, you know, the presenter, my colleague, was answering questions through audio, and I was answering questions through chat at the same time. Um, so having another person can be very helpful. Next is uh, scripting it, um, which is probably pretty common. Um, but assuming you don't have to worry about anyone seeing you for most of the presentation, uh, if you have screenshots or slides, um, you know, you can have a script there. I like to do it word for word, um, how you would actually say it. So for me, I even write in like so's and ums and things like that. Um, and then I can literally read it word for word. Um, also include cues in the script for yourself, like when to use spotlights or highlights or zooming in or clicking on certain links. And, um, you know, maybe you want to check in with the audience every now and then and ask them questions. So you can write that into the script. Seven is uh, personalizing it as much as possible. So um, if you can, showing your face, uh, since that's automatically more engaging, even if it's just once at the beginning. So we usually do that, just say a quick hello, and then we get right into our slides. Um, also, you know, saying a few things about yourself and chatting with uh, attendees as they arrive into the room. Um, you know, just like you would in the physical setting if you um, are teaching a class and you would naturally just chat with the students as they walk into the classroom. Um, the next tip is leaving time for questions. So um, our webinars usually tend to be about 30 minutes or maybe a little less than that. We try to leave at least 10 minutes for questions and usually all of that time is used. Um, keeping track of the questions throughout the presentation, uh, if you can, is always a good idea. Um, depending on your setup, they could come in through audio or chat or both. Um, that's why it's helpful, helpful to have another person. And also, um, when it's necessary, following up. So you might want to do this if you run out of time, of course, or you get complex questions. Um, for example, one that I remember from our last one was something like, how do I use Google to find full text items in our library? Um, so that just requires a little bit more of in-depth instruction. Um, you know, we have to tell them how to go into their Google settings and change the library links and all that. Um, so that was a case where, you know, we asked, you know, do you mind if we email you? Is it okay um, to answer your question via email? Uh, next tip is following up. So after the webinar is finished, um, it's a good idea to share the recording, not only to the people who shut up, but to uh, your entire community, um, share it on your blog, your website, uh, your social media pages. If possible, if you've had um, attendees register, um, sending thank you emails with a link to the recording for those who did show up. Um, and also, this is a good opportunity, um, if you do have the uh, luxury of emailing attendees, even including some follow-up questions in the form of a quick survey. Um, so one of the 
um, things I've been wanting to do is uh, implementing this and asking attendees what topics they'd like to see covered in future webinars. Um, so that'll just uh, help you sort of uh, restart the process, so to speak, um, which connects to the last tip, which is assessing your efforts. Um, so you aren't going to know what works well unless you do this step. Um, and like I said, it just helps you improve for next time and restart the cycle over again. So for marketing efforts, um, looking at your blog and your social media views, um, how many clicks did your posts get? Uh, how many clicks did your ads get if you had ads on your website? Um, of course, looking at your attendance numbers, um, which might not mean a lot, you know, looking at each webinar individually, but they're helpful to track over time. That way you can correlate attendance numbers maybe with certain topics, um, certain times of the day that you decided to have those webinars, or even your marketing efforts. Um, you can start to make some connections there and uh, maybe hypothesize that certain things might work better than others. Um, and finally, just being aware of all the questions and feedback that you get throughout the process. Uh, whenever we start promoting webinar, we usually get a handful of questions from students. You know, this sounds really interesting, but I have a commitment at that time. Is there going to be a recording? Um, so we've actually made a template to answer that question that anyone on our team can use since we get it so often. Um, and also, uh, if you record the webinar, looking at your chat transcript, um, all the Q&A that took place, and if you decided to um, send any follow-up questions or surveys, of course, looking at that as well. So uh, that's about all I have. I hope I fit in the time slot. And again, thanks for coming, and I'm willing to take any questions. Uh, doesn't look like we have any in the chat room. Thanks for the compliment. There's a compliment in there. Thank you, yes. Susan. <laughs> Keith, if you want to go ahead and go ahead and get started. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks again, everybody. Yes, great presentation. Thank you. Sure. Hi, everybody. I'm Keith Burkhead. I'm a reference librarian with Guilford Technical Community College. And what I'm going to talk a little bit about is uh, creating a library video, which is something we did this year, um, which is a very interesting project to say the least. This isn't like doing a podcast. If you've heard my presentation about creating a podcast in the last couple of years, this is very, very different. It's going to have a much steeper learning curve. Um, if you're just starting out like we were, you're going to make a lot of mistakes and have the frustration that goes with it. And of course, you may walk out of here and create an Oscar winning short on the first try. If that happens, forget everything I talk about here and tell me your secrets. If it is so much trouble, then why do it? A video can be a great promotional and marketing tool for your library. If for some reason, a video has a certain amount of tech cool. It makes you look like you're on the cutting edge, as it were. The surprise for us with this was that this became a fun team building exercise. And you have staff with a creative bent. Video is a great project and outlet for them. Decide what you want before you start and what res resources you have to utilize. For example, is the purpose informative? Is the purpose to introduce staff to viewers? Do you need or want a theme? Do you have a budget of any amount? Do you have the proper equipment, including an editing tool? And do you have access to a knowledgeable resource person, especially about technical issues? Our process was very informal. I was looking for something different for an annual goal and suggested a video to our director. She said yes, and forward we went. This led to a months long process of writing, researching, self teaching, coming to grips with the realization I'd bitten off way more than I could chew. I asked staff for suggestions about a theme. The final two choices were Guardians of the Galaxy or a detective theme. 
We quickly realized the Guardians of the Galaxy idea was a non-starter. There are reasons movies like that have those 10-figure special effects budgets. And even semi-decent Guardians of the Galaxy costumes were more money than we had. So back to the detectives theme we went. Budget will also impact your choice of editing tool, filming equipment, and who makes up your cast. There are several logistical considerations. Do you have a good space? Do you have someone versed in shooting and editing video? Do you have a software package for editing? Do you have the equipment? Do you have ample time for putting it all together? Do you have staff buy-in and the support of management? A few more comments on logistics. Space needs will be impacted by the details of what you're shooting. Is your theme conducive to a big open space or do you need a small furnished room? Time is a, is a huge factor. Someone will have to write and coordinate the video. Someone will have to shoot the video, preferably in more than one take. Someone will have to edit the video. And it's a lot of person minutes involved in one project. And having support from management is, is pretty important. Even if they don't appear in the video, and happily our directors of good sport and did, um, those who do participate will take your cue about enthusiasm from those above. Software. There's a lot of video editing software out there, various, various degrees of complexity. If money is an issue, there are several high grade editors available for free. Hit Film Express, Filmora, DaVinci Resolve, Lightworks. Of these, Filmora is the easiest for absolute beginners, but the others come with more functionality, even in the free version. Now, confession time on my part. I experimented for weeks with Hit Film Express and then gave up. That's not a criticism of Hit Film Express. I realized it had more firepower than I needed or could easily understand. Another editing option, online editors. I discovered that for some reason, an online editor worked best for me. In this regard, less became more. Online editors generally have less functionality than software installs. The trade-off is a lower uh, learning curve and improved ease of use. There are several good free online editors, and the cost for those that do charge is still substantially less than software packages. Examples include Movie Maker Online, ClipChamp, which is the one I used, Adobe Spark, Online Video Cutter. Of course, there's a drawback to free editors. They will be limited in terms of add-ons, such as filters, effects, and sound clips. Be prepared to pay to pay for a supplementary software installs or another tier of functionality if you want more when using one of the free options. If you have to make a choice about uh, something to purchase, I would go with sound clips, a video without background music or, or appropriate sound is lack, just lacking something. Lights, camera, weight. Did you write something? I strongly urge having a video, a script for your video. I wrote the script for hours, but I like writing and I like to think I'm funny. Creating even a simple outline before actually starting on the script will give focus and cohesion to your script. I didn't create one and it showed at times during the writing process. I went off the rails and was even all over the map, went on the rails. And a script will make everyone more comfortable. It gives your cast an idea of what to expect and what tone you're going for. Equipment. Um, this link, uh, which you'll be able to access, of course, will show you the basic equipment for making videos. And when you look, get a chance to look at that, you'll see that even low-end video making has a stiff entry cost. Um, the lowest uh, for complete equipment I could find was still came up to about $1,000, $1,500. I'm putting that information in here for complete completeness and those who have the budget. Here's what we did. I shot the video on my phone. And obviously the decisions here are driven by how much you have to spend or what equipment you have access to. 
the dramatis personae, personae. If you have access to professional actors, by all means use them. A seminar trained alternative would be students from your drama or performing all arts program. Part of our purpose was for viewers to meet the staff, so the cast was, you guessed it, the library staff. Obviously not everyone is going to be comfortable in front of a camera, but you don't want to leave anyone out either. Plan your project and scale accordingly, accordingly to what people are comfortable doing. It was definitely amateur night, but also a great deal of fun. An unexpected benefit was some solid staff bonding time. Final observations. Um, this is a much larger project than doing a podcast. I enjoyed doing the work and learned a lot, but even working with just one more person would have made it easier, and I think would have produced a better finished product. Having said that, someone will have to coordinate all the moving parts. In our case, I took that on out of my personal interest in learning how to do, do this. Then I showed the video to a friend who's a professional videographer. At least he was kind, great acting and good script. Now we need to talk about camera framing and editing. And of course, all I could say was, yes, I know. All that to say, your first video will be a raw, unpolished, finished product. Embrace that reality and get on with it. And if you want to get better, be willing to hear honest feedback. And again, I've decided less is more. Now that ours is finished, I'm over the creative rush. I do think it is too long. Ours clocks in in about 10 minutes. Five minutes is a good target. Uh, these are some links to, to getting started. Links to some editors. Uh, as I mentioned, the one I used was ClipChamp. And these are some links to some free music and free sound effects. And lastly, a link to the video to the video we did, in case you uh, would honor me by taking a look at it sometime. That's pretty much everything. Uh, feel free to email me or call me, and I'll give you what advice I can. And we'll see you at the movies. Thanks, Keith. That was really good. Um, anybody got questions? Um, Susan asked if you could put the link for the video in the chat room uh, because she couldn't keep, uh, click on it in the, the screen share. Oh, okay. And somebody asked, um, did your actors memorize their scripts for doing the video? Oh, no. No, we uh, had note cards. And you, you can see that in the video, but it was just easier for everyone that way. Yeah, if you could share that link to that yeah. video. and Yeah, there you go. Yeah, here we go. And that was the link to our video, the one we did? Yes. Susan, uh, let me get your email address and I'll send you the uh, exact URL. And Susan also asked, what shelf life do you plan on these videos uh, having? That's a good question. Um, I think probably for, all, for the amount of time we had to do it and getting coordinated schedules and all that kind of thing, I think uh, nine months to a year. I would like to have put up another one by the start of the next fall semester. If you have more time and more people, then that's certainly, you can certainly up that uh, schedule a bit. And yes, uh, oh, he, he want, uh, Janice wanted to know if you could make the, the link available for everyone. Uh, keep in mind the link that I sent you at the very first of this, will be where the conference puts all their materials. So the PowerPoints will be included in those as well. Yes, I will. Um, certainly anyone who wants the, wants the link um, will be able to have it. Yep. Uh, Keith, just a, a question I had. 
how do you think your time is going to be different on the second when you know as you make videos you see the time it takes to do these go down dramatically or about the same well hopefully i've learned enough on the software side to um, make that a process a little bit smoother and i would certainly shoot as far as just in terms of the content of the video go for something shorter excellent go ahead yeah I was, and if, I, if, if the opportunity presents itself, I'd like to go uh, to shoot it in more than one take. We, we tried to do it all in the space of about three hours, and that um, was uh, less than conducive to a, a nice product. I like what we have, but it could have been smoother. Gotcha.